collection. And it can in include um, low-tech or low-tech uh, uh, modifications like changing out drawer handles or high-tech modifications like um, automatic door openers. It can um, include structural alterations or moving walls. It can include um, adding adaptive equipment like uh, the, the types that Kevin has showed you today. And um, they, the alterations can be low, no cost, low cost, or high cost solutions. And it also can, can include changing your lifestyle behavior. And that means um, you may have to relocate the child's bedroom closer to the bathroom, or you may have to um, change your personal habits like keeping the uh, floor clear of clutter. Another wife plus, right? She'll appreciate that. Okay, so um, <coughs> you all know why you're, you are wanting to improve access and, and um, function of your home. I don't have to tell you. But I want to give you this slide so that you can um, use some of these buzzwords to um, uh, devise letters or write up letters of need for the charities that you're going to be seeking out or the insurance companies who are going to be funding some of your home modifications. Because a lot of insurances will pay for a DME, but they will not pay for um, the actual structural changes in your home. So we have to kind of be scrappy and um, really search out some of the funding sources that are out, out there and available for you. Okay, so the um, reason why we're doing a home modification is to improve access, to improve function, to improve independence. Well, these three, access, function, independence, are all buzzwords you can use and um, letters of need and, and, and medical justification, including the letters that you may send to charities um, soliciting funds. Our ultimate goal in, in home modification, though, is to provide a struggle-free home environment for everybody. Um, home should be a place where you are fully understood, and that includes the person with a disability. And I say for everyone, and I'm stressing everyone, is because we, as we age, we're all going to need to modify our homes. If you can go home this evening and, and take a look around your home and pretend that you're 70, 80 years old with some kind of mobility um, issue, see how, how easy it is to access the areas we're asking our disabled population to, um, that are currently facing this problem. So when you make your modification for your loved one who has a disability, you ultimately may be making that uh, modification for yourself as you age, if you age in place in that home. Okay, let's take a look at some other questions that we're asking ourselves when we're considering home modifications. And that is, um, what does your family need to uh, make your home more accessible? Well, you have uh, a few options. You can remain in place, uh, which really is, an, is a long-term solution and can be risky, um, safety-wise. You can relocate, and that means either relocating um, the bedroom, like we um, spoke about before, or actually moving. Um, if you know that you're going to have a loved one who's going to need to use a wheelchair in the future, and you live in a two-story home, you'll save yourself a lot of money if you can relocate. And a lot of us can and can't in California. Real estate is at a premium, and so we, there's a lot of two-story dwellings out there. And you may like living in your two-story dwelling, so that may not be a viable solution for you, but it may be more a viable solution for renters who have a little bit more mobility. I've also included in the back of resources um, an apartment guide um, website where they can help you look for single, or rather, um, yeah, single story housing as well as um, ground floor um, apartments that are already um, disability ac accessible. So there is that um, option. Another option is to rearrange, like changing furniture and altering, altering, altering your lifestyle and uh, restructuring, which is um, what home modification uh, is, is about. So rearranging and restructuring are part of home modification. So other questions are, who is going to help us? Because we need help. This is, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a, a medical management issue, as well as fit, we're managing physical and uh, psychological issues. And um, to ensure success, you need a team, a teamwork approach. And you do need that teamwork approach as well in home modifications. And some of the people, there are lots of people out there that can help you. And some of the people that you may want on your team is, of course, all of your family members. Because the shame muscular dystrophy affects that person, but it also affects how the family functions as well. So all the family members should have a say in uh, the home modification plan uh, to see if that works for them as well. 
Um, healthcare providers are essential parts of uh, members of the team. Your OT and PT can provide accessibility evaluations and plans. Your MDs can provide the prescriptions and the medical justification. Your social workers can provide um, resources um, with funding and um, look at uh, the low income uh, benefits out there if you are in that category. Uh, your DME providers are crucial because they know the equipment, they know um, the measurements and the application of the equipment. And your contractors, of course, are going to be very important. And uh, also, I want you to try to include some financial advice, whether that be your dad, in my case, or whether you have a financial advisor um, that can um, help you with planning uh, over the long term um, how to save up for modifications and how that affects your um, home value and how it affects your retirement plan and how it can affect your taxes as well, because you can take some of these um, costs off as a tax deduction. And then, of course, your insurance companies. Okay. I would uh, recommend at least one of your team members have uh, some special certification or training in um, home modification and aging in place. Uh, aging in place is a principle that is used by a lot of contractors who are working to make um, the elderly um, population's homes ac uh, remain accessible and to remain in place as they age. Um, and there are some overlaps between aging in place with the elderly adaptations and our uh, population with the disabled, um, like ramps and, and stair railings and things like that. So we can apply some of those principles to um, a home modification for um, a pediatric client. Uh, but I think with a pediatric client and uh, especially with the Shane Muscular District, when you have these health care needs that are changing over time, I think you need another um, certification that deals with home modification, specifically with um, uh, different diag medical diagnoses. And that is the executive certification at home accessibility and modifications. So at least one of your professionals should have uh, one of these um, specialized training. Okay. Let's take a look at where in the house is likely to um, need the modification. And I'm going to be speaking um, just on uh, bathroom modifications and access to the house today because everywhere really needs to be assessed whether it can be um, accessed and have good function for your loved one. So uh, let's look at the home entrance. Um, we have thresholds, we have steps, and we have stairs that pre present as barriers to this population. And we're going to look at how um, a home entrance can um, be altered. At least one entrance in your house should be accessible um, by a wheelchair. And you also need an emergency exit as well, so that needs to be thought about. Uh, railings should always be for steps and stairs. And this, you can see this house does not have any kind of railing for uh, the steps. And um, other areas you want to consider with at to, excuse me, for home access are uh, backyards, pools, and garages, anywhere the family congregates. You're going to want to be able to continue to have your loved one participate in family life. And another um, <clears throat> concept I want you to think about is um, visitability. And that's a home's ability to provide access to people with all types of physical challenges. And that includes people in wheelchairs. So when we're talking about um, children with disabilities or anybody with a disability or, or a physical limitation, we want them ultimately to continue to participate in life because that affects your quality of life. So uh, if you have grandparents or extended family in the area or if you have friends' homes and they're having a birthday party, you're gonna be able to, um, you, you want to be able to provide a way of access into those homes as well. And I'll show you um, some examples of that in the, show, in the slides coming up. So let's take a look at um, thresholds. These are some um, products out on the market. There's lots of products out on the market. These are just two that I, show, I chose to show you. The rubber mat into the threshold right here is nice because it's uh, quiet and durable, um, cushioned, and everybody can um, use that and see it and uh, access the home, feel, feel comfortable accessing the home. This next door line bridge threshold uh, ramp over here on the right is an example of a visitability type of um, adaptation. It's, it's portable, you can throw it in the car when you're going over to grandma's house, and then they'll be able to access 
uh, the house uh, with any kind of um, uh, levels, elevations. There are two elevations we have to tra traverse over. As you can see, this might be from a porch that's attached to a, to a house with some kind of um, threshold right there, and then you have to add, you use another, you have to go over another threshold to get in the house. So this may be a way of um, bridging that those gaps. Uh, and then there's also double thresholds for both sides of the of the a glass slider, and there's also a um, an adjustable threshold that you can probably throw in the car if you don't bolt it down. Um, and there are some knobs down below there so you can adjust it and you can adjust the height of it. And also we have ramps for some steps here and uh, uh, I would suggest you always get together with your DME provider because they can actually come out and measure your steps and provide the um, necessary length of the ramp because that matters. The rise matters because it affects the length of the um, ramp. And over here if you don't have um, an ability to use a ramp um, or you want to, uh, or you have a 90 degree angle of where that landing is to go into the house in a very narrow door, you may want to use a, um, a wheelchair lift. And as you can see, it, when it goes, when it raises, it's um, flush with the um, landing as well as there's a straight line into the door. If this person could not um, get into the door if they used a ramp on the side because that door is uh, very narrow, and the landing is narrow and to make a right hand turn you need at least a 36 inch door and to make that alteration would be um, actually having to tear down some of that brick so the more economical um, long-term solution is to do a wheelchair lift into um, the residence okay stairs uh, these are two ways of providing access upstairs. One, if you're a wheelchair user and you don't want to buy a second wheelchair um, to keep upstairs, then you need to get that wheelchair up the stairs. So this is a, a way of doing that. And these are these are portable. They can, you can tear these down and, and bring them to the, another home if you need to. And that bar um, on the stair chair lift uh, or wheelchair lift can fold down and the, and the um, the platform can fold up so then you can access, anybody can access the stairs. And then they're also, you're probably familiar with the um, stair chair lift. Uh, this is a person who's um, maybe a little bit more mobile upstairs and can still ambulate. Um, if you elect to use this and, and you are wheelchair bound, you may have to have a secondary type of mo mobility device upstairs so they can access the areas around upstairs as well. And then I wanted to show you this um, modification. They killed two birds with one stone here. Um, they made access from the front of the house using a nice sloped um, hard surface, level surface, into the back of the residence. So it's, um, but they also incorporated the, the backyard patio. So this person can um, access both areas as well as around to the front of the house or the other side of the house uh, on the right there. Um, this has really good curb appeal as well as style adapt adaptil adaptability um, and, and can provide good resale value because it, there's, the structural changes are very aesthetic and anybody can make modifications to make it, to make it their own home. You wouldn't have to tear up um, ramps or portable ramps or anything else that you make um, modify for your home. But this is just an option. Okay, so... Um, this is Southern California, and we have lots of pools out here. And um, the boys enjoy swimming, and um, can be the pool can be very therapeutic for them. So we want them to be able to continue to access that. And these are two um, examples of in-ground in pool access lifts. One is a hard seat, and one is a sling type. And then you also have your portable lifts, which can be taken around any part of the pool to access it, as well as uh, take it with you when you when you move. Above ground pools are very popular, the swim spas are very popular right now, and there are lifts um, available to get the children in, into those areas as well. Uh, okay, bathroom modifications. Why is it that the, the bathroom in a home is a smaller spa space, and yet we have to have cram so much stuff in there, and we do so much stuff in there? It's crazy, right? And remember when I told you that bathroom or that um, home modifications are for everybody? Well. This is, they're even for uh, super geeker, geek gamers too. So I thought this slide was funny. 
um, in that uh, where's the sink and where's the shower, right? <laughs> I guess they don't shower. Ooh. Oh, they've got a keg. Oh, I know. they got a kegerator here. It's awesome. Um, and I also thought that uh, a PT had, had to be involved in um, modifying this bathroom because there's some kind of exercise machine down here <laughs> that they're using. All right, enough levity, right? Okay, so let's take a look at your standard three-piece washroom and space planning. Some of our bathrooms look like this, where we have the sink, the toilet, and the tub. We've got a five foot by eight or nine foot space and uh, a 32 inch door, sometimes even a 30 inch door. Um, and uh, we gotta get a lot of stuff in the, we gotta do a lot of stuff in the bathroom. So how do we do that? Well, an accessible bathroom needs a 34 to 36 inch pass-through door. Uh, it should, that's the best. A wheelchair accessible vanity or a wall mounted sink if you're going to access the sink. Uh, grab bars around the toilet and shower and non skid flooring. Ceramic tile is the best. It provides the best coefficient of friction and it's durable and it's pretty inexpensive. So that would be my recommendation for flooring in the bathroom. Uh, a low threshold shower or some way of um, accessing that tub. Uh, adjustable handheld shower head and your shower space for a stand-up shower should be 36 by 36 and your roll-in shower should be 36 by 60 but the best I found uh, adaptation is a 42 uh, inch um, depth shower um, 60 inch length and then you need some clear floor space to maneuver a wheelchair around uh, even if minimally <coughs> scooting it left or right to, to get in there and to do your business uh, some other elements uh, you may want to think about is how easy is the, are the fixtures that are being able to use, such as um, changing out turnstile levers to um, turnstile control to levers. It's easier to push and pull than it is to turn and pinch and hold. So anything that um, can be changed out that makes it easier, like a lever style hand, handle on the door and handles on the faucets and fixtures. Uh, will be uh, should be considered. You can add non-skid non -skid strips, that's easily done, pretty cheap, uh, around the areas that get wet. Uh, Non-glare lighting is, is good, anti-scald faucets. Um, and you want to round your, your corners on your countertops if you have countertops, just in case there are some falls, you don't want that sharp corner uh, hurting. Uh, it's going to hurt anyway, but you, the sharp corners may tear skin. And then um, you can also consider rocker style glow in the dark light switches. Anybody ever seen those? They're pretty cool. But it takes the thinking out of moving through a space that a person with a disability may um, find they're having trouble with. Where's that light switch? I gotta have my balance. What goes first? I gotta do the light switch and then the balance may go. So anything, any alteration that you can make, even if it's you know, the, the slightest little thing, um, and make that task easier for that person, which is, then decreases the risk of falling and injuring themselves. And you also might want to um, consider a heated lamp or heated flooring because if they're uh, being assisted in bathing, then they're going to have um, some period of waiting to get dry and things like that. <coughs> okay. So how do we modify this bathroom first? Let's, we have to first get in the door. So if we have a 32 inch door, you see this blue area right here with the little doorknob on there. That's your two, your one and a half to two inch door. So you really don't have a 32 inch um, opening. You have a 30 inch opening. So how, there's an easy way to fix this without breaking the bank, and that's um, installing swing away door hinges. And that add that will add two inches to uh, the pathway or pass, passageway. So you can see if you have a door that only opens 90 degrees, you can actually get that door to be flush. Then you may have to change out the handles so they don't have such a high profile, they have to be a low profile handle on the door, on the back side of the door. Now let's take a look at some tub solutions. So if you have a, a child or a family who likes to take baths, uh, this is a way of getting the child in, in the bath. That they can uh, transfer into this hydraulic lift, bath lift, and be lowered into the bathtub and immersed in the water. If you have an older child who is able to um, transfer into a tub chair, I like this tub chair because it has both legs inside and outside of the tub 
making that more stable, and it has a back on it. I think all your tub chairs should have backs on them with this population. And then I also like this because there's a handle for the uh, shower nozzle right there, and that can um, promote some independence uh, for the child, a little bit of autonomy. Another um, modification, uh, if you have a person who's wheelchair bound and they need to um, access the tub in a system, you can use the Hoyer lift that Kevin was talking about, putting him in, put the child in the um, bath chair, wheel the bath chair in, connect the bridge and slide the um, person inside the tub. If you have a rolled-in shower, the bath chair uh, commode combination on the right side may be uh, the option that you choose, roll-in type of shower. Uh, if your space is really limited, and a lot of our spaces are really limited, um, and you don't want a lot of lifts and because you have all this DME equipment in your house, this may be an option in that you um, mount the lifting mechanisms on the ceiling or on the wall. And uh, uh, one of these ladies in here, I think you were, showed me uh, a floor-mounted lift if you don't have a wall structure that can support um, a lot of weight. So in this case, you can lift the person right out of the bed and roll them through a motorized lift into um, the bathtub or shower chair that's waiting. And then in this situation on the right, the person can wheel himself into or be wheeled into the bath uh, room and then have the wall-mounted lift or floor-mounted lift, put them in the bathtub or in a bath chair that's in the tub. All right, let's take a look at how to convert a tub shower um, into a roll-in shower. And this is a before and after picture. Uh, you can see that they're using the footprint of the current shower, uh, and I think they widened a little bit. And uh, they replaced the tile, they took out the tub and, re and took out the uh, shower door. They sloped this, the bottom of the shower for the drain, and they added the um, shower uh, head, the adjustable shower head, and held. Now, you can see that this bathroom is not ideal because it, it, it looks like there's a right turn into um, the bathroom and uh, very little space. There's supposed to be 30 inches between, <clears throat> excuse me, between the, the toilet and the wall. And usually your wheelchairs are about 28 to 30 inches, so it's a pretty tight squeeze. And I would modify the toilet and those handrails there to see if we can't get in better. But this may not be the, the best solution, but it is a way of showing you how um, some people are doing it. This is another modified three-piece washroom. You can see this is the ADA standards of how, how uh, space planning is supposed to go in, in uh, probably a relatively um, new home. Everybody has to use the ADA standards, and especially in um, public spaces as well. And you can see how here what they did is take out that tub space and, and lay down shower, or lay down tile. And I, what I like about this um, is a demonstration that you can use um, different kinds of tiling depending on uh, the function of that area. So they tore out the tiling in the shower and extended it out a little bit and sloped it. And they used small two by two tiles, which is better for um, friction and um, uh, non-skid. And yes, I want you to notice that all these showers that I, and bathrooms I'm going to show you, they have floor to ceiling tiling applications. Then you also see that they have the adjustable handheld shower. They didn't modify the vanity, maybe they didn't need to in this person's case. There's some more examples of uh, standard tub spaces that are converted into showers. And I, this looks like they pulled out and extended out the um, shower a little bit. And right here is a, <coughs> excuse me, a rubber um, barrier threshold so that the chair can roll right over the rubber, the rubber collapses, but then it inflates back up again and then holds the water in. It's not the most ideal. It's better to have a sloped shower with the two drains, but um, you gotta you gotta work with what you got. This doesn't look like a um, on the right here a c up to code, <laughs> but this is how some people are doing it. So you have to check with your city. That's why it's good to have a, a licensed contractor to do that for you. And every city has different specifications for a roll-in shower. So this looks like they used um, the regular shower space, and they used that rubber barrier, and then they also had some kind of a drop down and tile application, and, but that looks like it would be very difficult to, to wheel a person into uh, the shower, especially if they're heavy. Some more examples of some shower spaces. This is a wall hung sink. I recommend a wall hung sink if you have a very small space. 
um, because then you can maneuver that wheelchair around. Because it's high up, your your um, the legs of a wheelchair can fit underneath there, and therefore you also have a, a bigger turning radius. Um, this bathroom up here is like, you know, really nice. <laughs> Um, and it looks like they, they stole some room from uh, a different space, maybe a closet or an adjoining room. But this is a universal bathroom. Anybody could use this bathroom. We could have a baby bathing in the tub and grandma sitting on the ledge and then a, wheel, a person who uses a wheelchair <clears throat> being able to access this tub. Not all at the same time, but you know. <laughs> uh, that would be weird. Um, but anybody could use this bathroom. I, I, I wanted to show you this example. Um, of what is being done in some homes. These are two corner uh, showers that are, uh, this one's a stand-up shower, but it can be converted to a tight wheelchair space by using a, um, a flip-up seat. You can get that out of the way, and anybody can use that shower, including a wheelchair. And I just wanted you to notice that there are different types of um, handrails or grab bars. This is an L-type, and then there, over there, there's just straight line. Um, this shower over here, again, is a, a multi-use shower, multi-person use shower, any person with a, no matter what the, the ability can uh, use that shower and, and again notice the small tiles on the bottom and then the floor to ceiling application of tile for waterproofing and water control. And here are some corner uh, showers that are quite tight in tight spaces. This one is uh, interesting. I think it works though. They've got the wall hung sink uh, for maneuverability, they have the, the rubber barrier here for the shower to contain the water. Um, and they have that flip up uh, handrail there for the toilet so that when you are accessing, it, it improves access when it's in the upright position, it improves access of that chair to go in the shower. And then also the attendant to come around and close the curtains and be in there and uh, assist the, the um, person. I really like this uh, one on the right. It has that really space-saving kind of characteristics. Um, it has that uh, zero threshold entry into the shower. Um, you can get a nice wheelchair or, or excuse me, a bath chair in there. And then you can see how you can configure the um, curtain. You can be having a, like, a circular pattern or half oval or whatever you need, a curve is what I'm trying to say, the word I want to say. Okay, and so this is uh, some examples of how you can modify vanities. Uh, this is an existing vanity that a um, finished carpenter came in and modified. And over here, this is uh, like the dream bathroom. Um, but this is an example of how you can have multiple users use it at the same time. So say you have two kids and one is in a, a, a using a wheelchair or a bath chair. They both could be in the bathroom and using it. I just wanted to show you that you can, um, the back-to-back -back sinks with the single lever uh, faucets, it's kind of blurry right there. But also um, another person who maybe have to sit doesn't have the balance to stand, can use that, as well as a wheelchair user can go in and use that shower. Okay, so how do we gain some space in, in tight places? Um, and it, one way is, is to modify your toilet or change out your toilet. You can see with the schematic here that the round front can give you two more inches, but if you like that oval uh, shape, then you can have a compact elongated toilet where you can see that the the tank is altered to give you more space, and that can give you um, one inch of space. And uh, one inch can mean a whole lot in, uh, when you're using wheelchairs and mobility devices. So we can steal some space from another room to make uh, the bathroom more accessible. In this situation, they have a pocket door, which I recommend, or you can use a sliding barn door if you need to, if you don't have room for a pocket door. Um, <coughs> But it looks like they relocated this bedroom here in, uh, next to a bathroom wall and punched out the bathroom wall to make uh, the bathroom a little more accessible. And here is the same um, kind of concept. And as you can see, you have greater than 60 inches for, of clear floor space to turn that wheelchair around. And you definitely need, in a manual wheelchair, you need about five inches of, or five feet, excuse me, of clear floor space to turn the uh, wheelchair around. And in a power chair, and especially if it's in an inclined position, need about six feet of uh, clear floor space to turn for turning radius. Okay, so the next question we can ask ourselves is when are we gonna do this? Well, it's difficult to know uh, 
when to make a modification, especially when your healthcare healthcare changes, healthcare needs are changing um, rapidly. So um, this is when you um, kind of elicit some help from other professionals or other people that have gone through it so that you can make the best decision um, for your situation. So what I've tried to do here is provide um, a schedule of modifications according to the stage that uh, the child is in or the person is in in distinct muscular dystrophy. And I want to highlight a couple of these. You have uh, this chart. I want to highlight a couple of um, areas here. And the first stage is the diagnostic stage or presymptomatic. And you may have noticed some, some mild gait disturbances. So in terms of home modifications, this is the proactive measure state step. So you want to relocate the house. Excuse me, not you're not relocating. This is not the Wizard of Oz. You want to relocate to, or change houses if you need to, and you can, or you change the location of the bedroom. Um, you definitely want to request a home safety evaluation from an OT and PT. They come into the home and they can assess um, areas that you never even thought of where, where hazards can be changed um, very simply um, by clearing your floor space of clutter, moving out excess furniture, and leveling out pathways uh, in and around your home. Um, so this is the stage where you plan to prepare and hopefully prepare a plan. Um, knowing that you have all these, this kind of schedule here, you can kind of see and predict what may come down the line. And so especially if you um, are a saver and you want to make a healthcare savings account or work with your financial advisor, you just start saving up for um, what may occur in the future if you can. Stage two and three I combined, and that's early and late stage ambulatory, and this is where um, it becomes difficult to rise from the floor and climb stairs, and they begin to start using to use a scooter outdoors. And this is your DIY projects if you're really handy, or handyman. Um, uh, you can hire a handyman to do these things. Uh, the safety measures, uh, excuse me, the, um, this stage um, in terms of modifications are um, characterized by safety and adaptive, adding to safety and adaptive equipment. So rearranging furniture, removing barriers, um, providing handrails anywhere the child needs it. So if you have a long hallway and they're having difficulty, put in some handrails uh, along the hallway. Anywhere they, they think they need the, the support, um, put in a handrail or a grab bar. You can use dressing chairs with a back on them. Sometimes it's difficult to continue to, to dress um, using a bed because it's too soft or it doesn't provide enough um, support. So you can have a, a, a little dressing chair in, there in the room to help them with those activities, um, adding night lights, some um, rocker style light switches. Remember, it's easier to push than it is to pinch or flip. Um, anti skull single lever faucets in, in the bathroom or kitchen. And then C and D style drawer pulls. So it's easier to pull and push than it is to grab onto a knob and pull. Um, and anything, like I said, to make the, the um, access easier than your cutting down on the risk for accidents. Um, some of the bathroom modifications are considered minor. You can grab bars, non-skid strips, um, adding a shower chair or bath uh, or, or a sink at the chair, a chair at the sink, um, a handheld shower. And then some of your modifications in terms of um, equipment could be a stair chair lift and a portable ramp. In stage four, this is characterized as um, using power mobility and in, in terms of uh, home modifications, this is where the big structural modifications may occur uh, if you can uh, swing it. Um, your bathroom mods that may occur in this stage are your, all your patient lifts, uh, your zero threshold shower, or adding a shower chair commode um, system, uh, making sure your wheelchair, your vanities are wheelchair accessible, changing your floor services, you may be expanding your spaces, and um, adding some automation like automated, uh, like uh, motion sensor lighting. Um, some of the access mods are adding the, the threshold ramps, uh, widening doorways, uh, adding the vertical lifts if you need to, relocating outlets so they're easier to reach uh, for the patient or the person, um, and adding video monitoring uh, connected to your smartphone. Lots of different um, technology out there. And that's, in fact, what stage five is all about. That's the non-ambulatory stage, the late non-ambulatory um, stage. And that's characterized as um, 
limited upper extremity function. So you want to add some voice activated uh, devices to uh, continue to promote independence uh, with the boys. And then some motion sensor lighting. You can expand that throughout the whole house if you haven't already. Um, charging devices for tech devices, getting them to still contain, <laughs> getting them to still uh, maintain some autonomy by giving them uh, an ability to charge their own devices. Okay, I've been being hurried up here. So, uh, how many of you are renters? Any renters in here? You do have <laughs> rights when it comes to home modifications. However, they are limited. Um, you have to be able to pay for them and you have to be able to change them or restore them when moving if you need to. So I would recommend um, using portable modifications rather than permanent. Um, and some of the modifications that are deemed reasonable are ramps, widening doorways, and adding uh, grab bars. So if, you have, if you're in a place that you really need a roll-in shower, I would suggest trying to move or having one of those systems that um, transfer the patient into a tub-based um, uh, shower system. You can always get more information from HUD. Uh, oopsie. And thank you for listening. And I will be available out in the lobby through the break if you have any questions, because I know I rapidly went through. I'll, my dog would appreciate this. I rapidly went through this presentation. Thank you.